Hello, everyone. Uh, we are very pleased to have uh, uh, Professor John Morse visiting us here from uh, York University, where he is um, a professor at the Department of Earth and Space Sciences and Engineering. Um, so he actually did his undergrad here at the University of Toronto. And after uh, he did his undergrad here um, in aerospace and space systems, he went off to the University of Arizona um, to do his PhD. Um, and he does a whole lot of different um, things, uh, very uh, much related to volatiles um, and atmospheres um, in different bodies in the solar system. Uh, so he uh, develops plant simulations at the Planetary Volatile Lab. Um, he is supporting service operations on the Mars uh, Science Laboratory rover. Um, he works on experimental studies on volatiles um, with Martian surface with the Martian surface and polar caps, um, and he's done, like I mentioned before, a lot of work on volatiles, which have led to um, two nature papers. Um, uh, so one of them is on uh, met the methane seasonal cycles um, on Mars, and another one is on these things called um, pentanates. Uh, I, I probably pronounced that incorrectly, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So I'm an astrophysicist, not a planetary scientist. <laughs> Um, so these are uh, these are like these snow ice blades that are formed by erosion, um, and so he is a very decorated um, astro uh, planetary scientist, and among many honors, many of which are early career awards, uh, he is named the York Research Chair um, in Space Exploration. He is a member of the Royal Society of Canada College of New Scholars, Artists, and Scientists, and uh, he, in addition to being decorated himself, everyone around him is usually decorated so much so that <laughs> his uh, research group has won um, the NASA Group Achievement Award 16 times. So we are very pleased to have uh, John Moore visiting us here, and he's going to give, I'm sure, an excellent talk. So thank you very much. All right, well, thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction. So, Today, what I'm hoping to share with you a little bit is a topic that I've been working on for a number of years, but you know, it's something that's really been heating up within the last year or so, and, and I've had a chance to really get into it and dive into it on my sabbatical. Now, with the heat up of methane on Mars, you may have heard in the last few weeks that there's also all this mystery around oxygen. So I think now we've got the oxidizer we need to really set this field on fire. So, before I get into talking about methane in the Martian atmosphere, uh, I wanted to sort of you know, give you a few slides to lead you into the sort of work that, uh, that I'm interested in. And a lot of the work that we do in the Planetary Volatiles Lab has to do with planetary atmospheres. And believe it or not, there are a few people out there that ask me, why is it that planetary atmospheres are important? Well, there's a number of reasons for that. First of all, the atmosphere is the most easily probed part of the planet. Uh, there are very few exoplanetary geologists, but we will have in short order. In fact, we already have a lot of people studying with actual data the atmospheres of exoplanets. We can see these things through the transit method at uh, vast, though not infinite, distances. And even around other planets in our solar system, we've been able to really get a good idea of the gas composition down to incredibly fine levels. For Mars, we now have gases that we know down to a few parts in 10 to the minus 13 bars, very precisely. Um, it's also true with the exoplanets, though, that the majority of the planets that exist in our galaxy do have atmospheres. So atmospheric processes are just really important to what's going on. And for my colleagues who work on the Earth, I have a picture of a transit up really close here. So we call this a limb observation. And you can see how the atmosphere just, just lights up. Um, the atmosphere is how we uh, actually recognize a lot of planets. So if I was to show you a picture of a whole bunch of exoplanets like this, I'm pretty sure that most people in this room could just look at this, and you know you're not looking at a bunch of billiard balls or you know, a, a collection of fruit. These are a bunch of planets. And we know intuitively that these are planets. But, but why is that? Let me uh, demonstrate with a really egregious example. So here are two planets, uh, one of which you probably know fairly well, the Earth. You're there right now. And uh, this is Kepler-62e. And you'll notice Kepler-62e, it's a bit bigger than the Earth. But there's lots of familiar things. You know, you've got the clouds, you've got the uh, oceans, you've got the, the land. How is it that we know that Kepler-62e looks like this? It's because it's an artist's rendering. 
So how did the artist know to draw Kepler 62e this way? It's because of his or her experience with the Earth and with the planets in our own solar system. So Kepler 62e probably doesn't look exactly like this, but it probably looks something like this. There's a lot of similarities there, enough from studying our own solar system that we can say something about these exoplanets from what is really very little data. There's another aspect to why it is planetary atmospheres are very important. And that's because the atmosphere encodes the history of a planet. Just by looking at the gases in the atmosphere, we can tell something about the story of a place and how it's got to be the way it looks today. Uh, we can look at volcanic outgassing and whether we're talking about a secondary or a primary atmosphere by looking at argon-40. We can look at isotopes of carbon to understand that cycling. We can look at the escape of water on Mars with deuterium to hydrogen ratios. And life, well, we're still arguing about exactly what that kind of signature looks like, but maybe it's disequilibrium, oxygen and uh, ozone together with methane, who knows? And uh, the atmosphere, it allows for some of the more interesting processes to occur. So one of my favorite bodies, Pluto, which you can see here, um, has a really fascinating geology that was not at all expected before we got there. We thought we were going to see nothing but sublimation processes, and instead we had this lovely view here. We've got some ice mountains with some uh, nice photochemical tholins interspersed, and there's catabatic winds that come off of this and give us dune fields across these bubbling um, solid nitrogen convecting fields. And what this comes from is that the upper atmosphere is cooled from the very fine particles in it. You can see those fine particles in the blue limb observation here of Pluto. Those fine blue particles tell us that it's very forward scouting and those particles are small. I can show you another example of this. So here's Mars. This is uh, from Gusev Crater. It's where the Spirit rover past its time. And it's a, it's a lovely scene that we've got here. You can imagine setting out a chair, sitting down, enjoying a drink, I'm sure, uh, as long as you wear your space suit and so forth. Um, it's an, a lovely picture, but I can make it even better. I can make it more habitable and take us back to the past. If you just pay attention to this chunk of the image here and just watch the little rock, I'm going to make one change. Just added a little bit of water and suddenly it's a much more inviting, a much more habitable place. And the reason for that is that if you're going to have standing liquid water, you need a substantial atmosphere to do that. Um, I've done this sort of, you know, in a uh, playful way here, but I can show you an image from another place on Mars, from Gale Crater, where I bet your mind will draw in the lake all by itself. So this is where the Curiosity rover has been wandering around. And you can see all of the different layers within that uh, lake. We're looking down towards the deepest part of the crater here. And you can just see that, that lovely shoreline. So here we have this, uh, this lovely, interesting picture. By this point, I hope I've convinced you that atmospheres are great. Uh, this is looking down into the deepest part of the crater, and this is the mountain in the middle, Mount Sharp, or Aeolus Mons if you're from the IAU. Oop, going the wrong way there. So that's all distant past Mars. Mars of today is where I've spent most of my career, and it's still an exciting and dynamic place. Here's a, a landslide caught in the act by high rise on the northern polar layer deposits. But there's other interesting things happening. The surface is fairly quiet. I wonder if there's something going on inside, and I wonder if there's something in the atmosphere, something in the trace gases that can help us to understand what's happening beneath the surface of current Mars. And that brings me back to methane. So let's start with the, uh, the facts, as you will, with uh, methane. So all of this begins with a very surprising measurement that was made back in 2003. This was eventually published by Mike Mumma and his collaborators in 2009 in Science. And what you're seeing here, this is the globe of Mars. It's a little dim, but the colors are where they saw enhanced absorption by methane in the atmosphere. The peak of this is a place called Nilithosae, 
and it goes all the way up to about 45 parts per billion by volume of methane, which for Mars is a fair bit. On the Earth we have more like two parts per million, 2,000 uh, parts per billion of methane, but, but for Mars this is a significant number. This was something that was really exciting, even though it was only a single line of methane, it did overlap with the telluric absorption lines, so it's something in our own atmosphere, um, but it was a huge amount of material we're talking about, 19,000 tons. And the place where it was emitted was also interesting. That Nile Fosse region is very fractured, and it's one of the few places where we see carbonates on Mars, which my geology friends get really, really excited about, let me tell you. What was really interesting, again, when they looked later, was that it was gone just four months from the time. So it appeared, and then it disappeared. The reason it was so sensational is that we don't expect methane to be there in these kinds of quantities. It's something that is not actually stable on present Mars. So to see it at all means that it has to have been supplied recently. The atmospheric lifetime of methane is only about 300 years on current day Mars. So that means we must have had some sort of injection of methane within the past 300 years to see anything at all. And to see it localized suggests that it was happening very quickly and then dis disappeared really quickly. So where could this methane be coming from? What are the sort of potential sources and sinks of this trace gas? There's a few here. This was uh, published uh, about 10 years ago now. Uh, we've got ideas involving, for instance, uh, we've got some, oh, there we go. We've got cosmic dust that comes in. You'll hear more about that later in the talk. So this is organic rich material that rains down onto all the terrestrial planets. You can hit that with UV and turn it into methane. Um, that material in the atmosphere then gets moved around by the winds, eventually destroyed by photochemistry. But there's another way that you can make it that is really exciting, and that's if you go down here. If there is water in the interior, one of two things could be happening. Uh, the sort of boring side of this, as boring as you know, hot liquid water on Mars is, um, is that you combine that uh, water with something like olivine that can serpentinize, and that releases methane as a byproduct. So it's the sap material that could be coming out. Over here, we have the part that really gets my astrobiology colleagues fired up, and that's the idea of microbes. There are lots of creatures on the Earth that produce methane as a byproduct of their metabolism. Could something like that be happening on Mars as well? And then this methane seeps out of the subsurface. Maybe it gets stuck in a watery cage for a little while before coming out. But maybe that's where this is all coming from. And what Mama saw was not inconsistent with seeps of methane that we see coming out of the ground on the Earth. So, yes? Mm -hmm. For methane production in an underground water reservoir, is there a like, critical threshold, say, volume of water, other properties of water in the underground, or is it just like some sufficiently large underground lake? could provide X amount of methane. How are you get to that? So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get into that part myself, but that is the subject of a lot of debate and a lot of discussion. Um, you probably don't need as much water as you think. It's, you can actually do things with films that are, are quite impressive. Thank you. All right, so Mama makes his discovery in 2003. He announces it at a conference. And uh, like good scientists everywhere, all the people at the conference go back and they look through their telescopic records to see if they actually discovered it first. <laughs> and it turns out some of them did. So Krasnopolsky has some papers in 04 and 06 looking with his telescopes from the Earth and he sees the signal of methane. The good folks at ESA working with the uh, planetary Fourier spectrometer on Mars Express, they go and train their new instrument which was never designed to look for methane on Mars and they see it too. And in fact, they're the first to publish in science in 2004. But there's a problem with all of these new measurements that are bubbling up. And that is that none of these observations agree with each other in time, in magnitude, in space. Luckily, none of them overlap with one another. So they don't directly contradict each other, but it's hard to come up with a consistent theory of Mars that allows them all to be right. So Mama, he sees his distinct plume near the equator. He sees it only once. By the way, he saw it again last year, so now it's twice. Planetary Fourier spectrometer. 
they see their enhancements mostly at the poles, changing with the seasons, and they're enormous compared to what Mama was seeing. So, you know, this, this is just a hash, but it's an important topic. We need to figure out whether that debate can be settled. And the only way to do that is with additional measurements. So both ESA and NASA decide that they're going to look into this. The NASA folks go first. So their trump card in this is the sample analysis at Mars uh, instrument. So this is basically a microwave oven sized instrument that sits within the body of this beast here. This is the Mars Science Laboratory rover. Um, very, very devilishly complicated piece of equipment. There are several hundred valves in that thing to control the gas flow from one place to another. And the part of it that's really interested in methane is over here, the tunable laser spectrometer. That's uh, a little spatial heterodyne. You can see over there the, or sorry, it's a Harriet cell. You can see over there um, what it would look like if you didn't have any shielding on the outside as the laser beam goes back and forth and back and forth to give you a path length of 16.8 meters. We had results. We landed on Mars in uh, 20, uh, uh, sorry, in 2012, and we started making some measurements. And the first thing that we saw was close to zero, or at least not inconsistent with zero. Over time, taking more measurements, we stuck with it, we were able to see some higher values. And you can see how this evolved over here. So here are the initial measurements that are in, not inconsistent with zero, and then we start to see these sort of little spiky things. It's interesting. That's a lot like what Mama was seeing. He saw a big spike of methane, and then when he looked again, it disappeared. It seemed to be small. So at least for curiosity, you could have plumes that are small and localized that give rise to those sorts of behaviors. And don't just take uh, curiosity's word for it. We'll see in a few minutes that there's corroboration for this one now. And that looks right here, like this. So this is uh, a paper from 2019 in Nature Geosciences from Marco Giorana and uh, other folks working with the planetary Fourier spectrometer. This is the first time you actually have the same event being observed from two different perspectives. So we had the plumes, the little spikes that we saw on the surface. At the same time, the Fourier spectro planetary Fourier spectrometer was looking down in the same region. And they had made some improvements to beat down their signal to noise they see the exact same thing. They see the same magnitude of plume in the same place as we saw it. So that is, uh, is really quite neat, I think. Just in case you're curious what a detection looks like, I know this is the uh, Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics, but if I may show you a little data for a minute here, this is what a low methane soul looks like. The empty cell, so when there's no methane in it, is the red line. The black line is the full cell. So when these lie on top of each other, we haven't added anything that absorbs into the container. You can see that the two lines separate themselves here between empty and full when you have high methane. And we can look at the low methane averages over here and the uh, high methane averages over here. So you can get a feel for what the differences look like. Uh, I've got another one of these plots I'm going to show you much later. That, uh, you know, so keep these in mind just a little bit. Now, we kept making measurements. We didn't stop after we saw the few spikes. Uh, we wanted to understand what was going on with methane, especially since we had seen almost nothing, then we'd seen sun, we'd go back and forth. Uh, there was a mode to the instrument that we could use called enrichment. And what that does is it removes a lot of the carbon dioxide from our sample, and it essentially enriches everything else by a factor of about 25. If you take a close look at our measurements over here, you'll see that there's a few that don't seem to have error bars. That's because enrichment changes the error bar from plus or minus two parts per billion down to about 0.1. So it actually sits inside the dot. If you just look at those measurements, you plot them all versus season by themselves, you get this plot over here. And what you see is over three Martian years, there is a continuing repeating cycle in terms of methane. There's a seasonal difference that we get here. And to me, that is even more confusing in some ways and even more exciting. I mean, with Mama's plumes, maybe something happened in the last 300 years. To have a seasonal cycle, there are sources and sinks active all the time in the present day, and that's what makes it so significant. 
the amount of difference we saw was enormous. Between the lowest part of the year and the highest part of the year is a factor of three change in the concentration. It's really hard to do that in chemical systems. Uh, when we look at most typical processes that we know are acting on Mars, <clears throat> like Pierre Yves Meslan did in 2011, that's what this plot is over here, he doesn't see a lot of variation. Uh, this plot is showing you uh, latitude versus time of the year. Curiosity sits on this magenta colored line here, and he predicted 20% difference, not three times. Very hard to explain this, very hard. It's in fact easier to rule out processes, which is what Chris Webster did in 2018 when he announced the seasonal cycle. Also, even weirder, there's a phase lag in the seasonal cycle as compared to most of the atmospheric uh, forcing mechanisms. That is a little bit of a hallmark of things going on in the subsurface. It takes time for the energy of the sun to penetrate down into the subsurface. So that was a little bit of a, of a clue there that um, you know, turned out to be a little bit important later on. All right, so those are the facts. Maybe not, not everyone agrees on them, but uh, that is most of what we're working with in this field. So the second part of the talk, folly. I first gave this uh, at uh, the Australian National University. So this is uh, a lovely picture of a sculpture called folly in Sydney. Uh, this is a, um, a little bread making facility that uh, didn't turn out so well. So there's a couple of possibilities to explain what's going on here. Um, there's a simple one. Everybody is wrong. Except TGO maybe. We'll get to that a little bit later. So that's clearly the simplest thing. <clears throat> it's also the least exciting explanation. This was raised in 2011 by Kevin Zonley, who is uh, you know, a wonderful person. But uh, you know, he and I disagree on this topic. And he makes an excellent villain for my talk. And I'm sure I make an excellent villain in his talk. He notes a few important things, especially about the early measurements. Some of these measurements are near the detection limits of the methods being used. So the planetary Fourier spectrometer, especially their early stuff, was very near the detection limit. The same thing with Krasnopolsky's stuff. With Mike Mama's work and with MSL's work, the subtracted signals are larger than the result. Mama's got to remove that telluric line. We've got to remove the pesky Florida air that's sitting in our optics. It does tell us, though, that we have the thing calibrated properly for the, uh, the wavelength of methane. He also argues we should be skeptical because none of the data sets, no two of them, are explainable by the same model. Though, of course, now we agree with, uh, with the planetary Fourier spectrometer. And here's a, an image that he showed at the Mars conference this past summer. As the measurements get better, the floor seems to fall away. So if you look at how much methane you have over time, so this is when the measurement was made, how much methane you have, it looks like it's going down and down and down. Often in science, that is a hint that there is something wrong with the, uh, the measurement <clears throat> that we are making. There's other problems, too. Atmospheric modeling suggests that the plumes might not look just the way that uh, MAMA sees them. And it's hard to understand why they disappear so fast. That is a real challenge. And uh, Lefebvre and Forger pointed that out back in 2009. So this is one possibility. There's another possibility, of course. We had a really startling paper in 2015. Everybody is right. <laughs> well, isn't that wonderful? So, Mark Fries and his colleagues announced in 2015, they suggested that the Mars methane plumes could just be the result of comet dust trail and planet interactions. So the idea is Mars goes through a, a cometary dust trail. This material hits the top of the atmosphere. You see it sh for a short bit of time. And then it's consumed and goes away. So his paper was just a correlation. There was no uh, mass balance or anything like that in it. Uh, however, it requires three different mechanisms to be true in order to work. First of all, you need to see the input of dust at the right time. <coughs> Secondly, you need to have that dust be converted into uh, methane very quickly. 
Uh, interplanetary dust particles and cometary dust has an awful lot of organic carbon in it, up to 24 weight percent. So there's definitely the feedstock there chemically. Getting it to turn into methane quick enough to see it as a plume, that is more of a challenge. And the third thing was after you make it, then you have to destroy it. You have to get rid of that stuff very quickly. And the problem is, on looking closer at these three pieces, unfortunately, the story falls apart. So Ruz Sarote took a look at the inputs of the cosmic dust. And it turns out that uh, Fries may not have been working from a full understanding of all of the different uh, plumes, or sorry, all of the different um, comets that Mars has interactions with. When you include those, the correlation goes away. Uh, I took a look at the mass balance. Can you make the methane fast enough? Can you then destroy it fast enough? And it turns out that, no, you can't actually do this. And in fact, we had a lovely natural experiment. The siding spring comet passed closer to Mars than any comet has ever passed to any planet in our solar system uh, back a few years ago. It dumped a historically large amount of dust in the atmosphere. Nobody saw a big plume of methane. Did they see other things, sign of it? That... Oh, yeah, they, they saw lots of sign, sign of it. Um, all of the, the different um, sort of geological compounds in there really show up in the atmosphere. Magnesium, I think, was a big one, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And the last thing here, number three, it looks like this might be an actually a uh, misreading of the paper that they cite. So this might just be an error. So is everybody right? Uh, probably not. One of the things that, that I think about when I think about methane on Mars, um, ever since I got into this game back in 2012, is not so much why, you know, is there any there at all. I, I don't sort of have, you know, Kevin Zonley's line of reasoning. Uh, but instead, I wonder why we don't see more of it. Where is all that organic carbon going? Because there's 240 tons of this stuff that falls on Mars every single year. Organic carbon feedstock just ready to be turned into methane. And when we take this material that we collect from the Earth's upper atmosphere and we put it in a Mars chamber and we hit it with UV, boy does it make methane. It makes a ton of methane. It starts off really quickly. It sort of asymptotes away as you use up that little bit on the surface. But eventually, it all gets converted into that methane. So if you were to convert the 240 tons of carbon all into methane, you would end up with 11 parts per billion in the atmosphere in the background all the time. Even if you uh, suggested on Mars, maybe we don't get full conversion. Maybe it's something more like 20% uh, if you use the hydrogen to carbon ratio in this stuff. That would be 2.2 parts per billion, which we don't see either. This is a, a really weird thing. Now, there is this sort of uh, paradigm from the 1990s that people thought that there was no organic carbon on Mars and no conversion to methane because you have enough UV over the planet to convert all of the carbon that comes in pretty much instantaneously. However, the problem with that feeling and that description is that the organic carbon that comes in as IDPs comes in in individual packages. It's not a monolayer spread over the surface. So most UV photons don't actually interact with an interplanetary dust particle at all. When you take that into account, it turns out these interplanetary dust particles can persist for a long time. And when we go back through the literature, we find that there are actually examples of organic carbon being seen mixed into the soil. When Navarro Gonzalez took a look at this in 2010, he saw it in the Viking measurements. And other people have seen it with Phoenix, with MSL as well. Just to give you an idea of what kind of lifetimes we're talking about here, uh, this is from a paper I had in 2017, uh, looking at the UV flux. So over here, you can see it by latitude, more at the equator and less towards the poles. And that means that the particles toward the poles live longer. So here we have a plot of particle size, again, versus latitude. And it turns out that there is a, a sort of a most long-lived size here, around 200 microns. And what it is is that stuff bigger than that burns up in the atmosphere. Stuff smaller than that gets consumed more quickly because of the square cube relationship of a particle that's being pulled apart by UV. You get up to a couple thousand years that these things can uh, stick around on the Martian surface. 
And if you slowly release that material into the atmosphere, you can get values that are on the same order of magnitude as the amounts of carbon in the soil that we've seen. What this plot is showing, here we've got latitude versus how much organic carbon should be mixed into the soil down here. If it's all converted, if we get 100%, that's the black line here. If you're talking between 20% and 100%, which is where we thought we were positioning ourselves, then you wind up sort of in this sort of gray area. And that agrees with the amounts of organic carbon that Phoenix has seen, Viking Lander 1, Viking Lander 2. If you get into this blue area, then you're talking between about 5% and 20%, and the cyan is less than 5% conversion. Not a single spacecraft, other than Phoenix, which has a big error bar, is really you know, consistent with that less than 5% conversion. So it's a strange that we have this story. We have the IDPs coming in. We have the organic carbon in the soil. We don't have the methane in the atmosphere. I guess I'm, I'm missing the sink. So you're adding this from the IDPs mm -hmm. to the soil. But then, to get some finite mixing ratio, they have to somehow be exhausted as well. What is the sink? Yeah, the, uh, it gets destroyed, the methane in the atmosphere, it gets destroyed by lime and alpha high up and oxida oxidation close to the surface. The carbon, this is the so that's the methane sink. This, um, the process of UV photolysis turns IDP carbon into methane, so it destroys it in the soil. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. In terms of thinking about the, you know, like how much in terms of these mixing ratios could they potentially be location dependent? Not even just in terms of like latitude or mm -hmm. variations, just like very locally potentially. Definitely, especially if the wind um, picks this stuff up and distributes it. You can imagine anything between complete homogeneity to thinking about you know some places may ha may actually accumulate a lot more. So, for instance, places that accumulate a lot of dust may accumulate a lot of IDPs. We've tried both of those end members, and it moves this stuff around a bit, but it's still within the same realm of possibility. All right, so now we move on to the last bit here. You know, we had the facts about methane, you know, the folly of methane. Is methane just a figment of our own imagination? And believe it or not, there's a Disney character named Figment, which is this guy here. And uh, he seems sort of boggled by methane himself, as you can tell. So let's get to TGO. That's the elephant in the room that we've had all the way through this talk so far. Um, TGO had a much more sensitive um, instrument than did the TLS. They were going to solve this problem. Gosh darn it. So they uh, published their results in April of this year, uh, Oleg Korolev and the rest of the ACS and NOMAD teams. And what do they see? Nothing, nothing at all, down to 0.05 parts per billion by volume. So now we have to start talking parts per trillion by volume. So here's the spacecraft here. And all of the downward pointing arrows are the measurements being made by the uh, TGO. There are some caveats. So first of all, those instruments, they've only been operating for a limited amount of time. We haven't had a whole Mars year yet. And for a lot of the time, a global dust storm's been active. That's the gray area there, which really plays with atmospheric dynamics. And it means that the spacecraft can't look very deeply into the atmosphere. At the same time, the TGO does provide an excellent constraint on what's going on, I feel. And like the TLS result, we are talking here about a team that was very highly motivated to get this right. And we are talking about people who are world experts in this particular topic. They knew no matter what they presented at the conference, people were going to throw rotten fruit at them. So, you know, they wanted to, to really get this right. And I feel the same way about my colleagues who work on, on MSL. So what I have taken, the perspective that I have taken this year, uh, which my colleagues say is an extremely Canadian perspective, is what if they're ball right? What if the TGO people are right and the MSL people are right? I go to conferences and it's just folks shooting arrows at one another. Let, let's use this constraint. Let's see what happens when we do that. So let's dig a little more deeply into the constraint that the uh, ACS and NOMAD give us. So before we had TGO, we didn't have much no knowledge of global methane 
below one part per billion on Mars, which is where that seasonal cycle we saw with uh, the TLS lives. That led us, in our thinking, to areas that were uh, perhaps not the best places. So for instance, we thought if Gale emits material, why don't other places emit the same way? And outside of the plumes, we figured that methane concentration evolves slowly. The whole Martian atmosphere mixes every three months. So we were thinking you know, that everything is a very slow process. But with that 0.05 part per billion upper limit, we now have to keep in mind the quick mixing of the atmosphere, not just at a global scale, but also at a local scale, where you can mix something from the surface up to a height where it can be observed by uh, TGO within a single day. And if we were to just maintain 0.41 parts per billion by volume, that is the average value the TLS sees, if we just maintain that near the surface magically and do nothing else, that is already a potent enough source that the TGO should have seen it. So we have to throw away the idea that we've got this you know, constant 0.41 part per billion by volume all the time near the surface. How do we square these things together? It turns out the timing and the context are the most important parts of this. For TGO, they're looking at a very large volume of atmosphere. They're from orbit and they're looking along the limb. What they're looking at is far from the surface. It's always above three kilometers, usually above five, and the most sensitive altitude is even higher than that. They're locked into so local sunset and sunrise because they're looking at the sun through the atmosphere. So they're always looking at a very specific time of day. Whereas for the SAM TLS, we're looking at a very small volume of atmosphere. Basically, whatever fits in the Harriet cell. We're looking very close to the surface, within a meter or so. And we're looking always, as it turns out, in the middle of the night. And that turns out to be the most important part of the story. That that timing is really, really critical because in the middle of the night, atmospheric mixing is inhibited compared to what's going on near the day, as long as you're very close to the surface. So here is the picture that I can paint, the theory of Mars in which both the TGO and MSL are correct. It looks like this. So let me walk you through this picture here. First of all, we talk to our geological friends, and they tell us that there should be a certain amount of micro seepage going on on Mars. Maybe it's very, very, very low, but it should be there. There's lots of this organic carbon that has infallen in the past, in early Mars history. Eventually, that is going to be cracked thermally, if by no other means, and it's going to make its way out. So we've got something going on there. We've also got, plotted on here, the height of the planetary boundary layer. That's the part of the atmosphere that is in constant contact with the surface through mixing. So during the day, uh, the PBL, as we call it, is quite tall. It's between two and six kilometers. And that's where you have this sort of homogeneous layer. Methane, we're going to say during the day, it's very, very low. So this is my schematic of methane concentration one meter above the surface and time increases as we move across the plot. So as we join our heroes, it is the middle of the afternoon. The PBL is high, the methane concentration is low, and suddenly the sun sets. When the sun sets, the convection slows down. The planetary boundary layer, for lack of a better term, collapses by which we mean that the mixing calms down. And so the layer near the surface that is continuously mixed gets thinner and thinner and thinner. The methane continues to seep out of the ground even as that's happening. So now that the mixed layer is very thin, maybe as thin as a few meters to tens of meters, that methane's got nowhere to go. It starts to build up and it gets higher and higher and higher. Here in the middle of the night, this is where we make our TLS measurements. They're made here because from a resource standpoint uh, with the rover, this is the most convenient time of day to make them. It's running around it, it, that's right, and this is a very uh, resource intensive measurement to make. So overnight, it continues to go up and up and up. And by the end of the night, the sun comes up again. 
mixing turns on and it turns on relatively quickly on Mars and the methane concentration goes down again to a low value over the, uh, the day. So, uh, the question is, mm -hmm. so, um, what does it care about the uh, EPL values, right? The, uh, what's the point is the uh, diffusion, the local diffusion coefficient, right? Question is, can, can, you, can you even get, can, uh, can, if I inject like a methane molecule at the ground, even then, can they can get within a few hours to the, to the top of the atmosphere, to the, to the top of the uh, EPL line? Yeah, it's very quick, actually, during the, the day. So we see this water vapor all the time in the formation of thunderstorms, for instance. Overnight, the uh, diffusion coefficient is much lower. And it's because the mechanism is different. You've got something that looks more like, um, more like molecular diffusion overnight. During the day, you're getting something that looks more like eddy diffusion. And there is something like seven orders of magnitude between those two processes. So it's a huge difference. Yeah, it's, it's important the next day. You can have that if, if it's very windy, but yeah. Really cold near the ground. Basically, the same reason, right? Right, and with crops, you actually put little fans on them to try to force the PVL to mix. Yeah, if you had high winds, but there's, there's no evidence that we have that high wind overnight. And especially for Gale, it looks like the wind pushes the air mass to the middle of the crater and confines it. So there's some interesting dynamics going on there too. You do care about the PVL a lot during the morning because then everything you emitted overnight then has to mix back up. I have a question I perhaps about to address. Mm -hmm. But in terms of making this measurement at night, how long does it take to actually get that measurement? Is it something you could do at multiple times in the evening? Takes five hours. <laughs> yeah. We, we, as you'll see later, I, we did an experiment where we moved this as close as we could to sunrise. So we were able to move it from midnight to about 3 a.m. So it's, it's a challenge with MSL. MSL isn't really designed to do this kind of diurnal methane measurement. So could another lander or rover do that? That's right. You're making my case for me. It's great. <laughs> yes, and, 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 and I, have, I have a suggestion for what we'll do. So stay tuned. All right. So the overnight concentrations that we see of methane are not global measurements. Everyone's assumed that there were global measurements in the past, that all the measurements we were making on Mars were global. Instead, they're a measure of micro seepage. They tell us about the local environment and what's going on here. So I have this eye chart on, on here of you know, using the diffusion theory to actually go and convert all these into rates of, uh, of micro seepage. And you end up with a picture over the year that makes a lot of sense. The simple average of this is about two and a half kilograms of methane per day if all of Gale looks like the region that we have been roving through. And what's great about that, that's more than an order of magnitude less methane than would be required if you were holding still at 0.41 parts per billion by volume during the day. Two and a half kilograms of sole is totally invisible to TGO when it's mixed throughout the whole atmosphere. So it works out pretty nicely. Now, my geologist friends don't want me to stop there, and I won't. We're going to figure out whether this makes sense coming from a steady source at depth. So those variations, uh, some people like to have their microbes near the surface and su suggesting that they were responding in terms of their metabolisms to different uh, amounts of methane. I want to be completely agnostic here and imagine that we have some source at depth below the annual thermal wave where it doesn't matter what time of day, what time of year it is, nice steady release. And if you put that into the model, what we can do is we can look at how it is that methane increases each night after the sun sets. So I did that with each of the days that we had a methane measurement. And that's this red uh, line here. And then I've plotted the individual measurement that we made with SAM TLS right here along with its error bars. So I do that on every single night and I generate this picture over here during the year. So this is the seasonal cycle, but taking into account the time of night we made the measurement and how that evolves in the atmosphere. And the fit there is pretty darn good. Uh, statistically speaking, yes, we're very consistent actually with a subsurface consistent 
um, emission of methane that is regulated only by diffusion and absorption in the regolith, which changes with temperature, which is why you see a seasonal effect to it. Um, we did a sensitivity analysis on this. There's less night before you make your measurement. There's more than that. Yeah, it's not, it's not just that. So this plot here is, is corrected for all of those things. Yeah. So it's a complete um, model that runs for the whole year. Okay. And I'm just taking the snapshots when we acquired the methane measurements. Um, all right. So sensitivity analysis here. Uh, you might argue maybe this point and that point are plumes. I don't know. Maybe they are. Maybe they're not. There's no way for us to know because we don't have time series. Um, you can try including them or excluding them. But when I do my sensitivity analysis and I'm looking at how much material comes out, that seepage rate, and I'm looking at how strongly it interacts with the ground, so that's the enthalpy of absorption down here, I get a best fit point, and that banana doesn't move around. It stays in the same place no matter which theory I try to test with my data. And the quality of the fits remain very good. We have lots of chi-square reduced values near one, which uh, makes me feel pretty good. The amount of seepage in that point right there is 2.8 kilograms per sol, which is actually pretty close to just the simple average of what we've been measuring. So, you know, that's all really nice. Now, there are problems in the sense that, you know, we don't have a time series. So we don't know which points we should exclude as plumes and which ones are part of the background behavior. And in fact, we got a surprise when we did push things later in the morning to see what would happen. We saw this. So if you remember those plots I was showing you with the red and the black lines earlier, where the red and the black lines were close to each other, we took a measurement, 3 o'clock in the morning. We were expecting to see a little bit more methane. We saw a huge amount of methane. So here is the red line, the empty cell. And then the full cell is the black one there. So in the instrument, there's something like 530 parts per billion of methane. When you take out the enrichment factor, that gets you down to about 20 parts per billion of methane. It's, it's a really exciting result. You can actually see it in just the raw spectra. It is such a huge signal. Uh, apparently, it made such a huge effect on some member of the team that they leaked this to the New York Times. <laughs> so this is known col colloquially within the team as the New York Times plume. So obviously, this is very different behavior than the background that we see with that nice seasonal trend. But it, you know, it, it gives voice to that question of how big is big? You know, what is a plume? How is it different than that you know, nice background that, that moves around? Oh, and by the way, um, I, I asked Kevin about this on the stage at Ninth Mars, and he thinks this is methane. So that is good. The weirdest thing about this, two days later, we tried this again gone. All right, so implications of the work that I've been doing. Sorry? So why did it go away? If you need the answer to that, um, I, I could pay you a very large amount of grant money. <laughs> so it should go away in 300 years. Uh, it's easier with MSL because we can just make the argument, oh, they're local, so the wind just took it somewhere else. But 20 parts per billion, that's, that's a lot to take somewhere else. All right, so despite what you may have heard in the press, um, and trust me, the press is entertaining to deal with when you work on methane on Mars, because everything is life. I have real sympathy for the people who work on water on Mars, which is rediscovered every year. <laughs> so uh, this model of mine, it doesn't solve the methane problem, because it doesn't say anything about plumes. Plumes are a much more challenging problem for the chemical models. MUMA saw 19,000 tons in 2003. That should still be with us today, but it's not. That's a hard thing to understand. And right now, we don't have the chemistry to tell us what's going on. This particular 2.8 kilograms per sol that I see in my model, for the background, though, does still have some questions associated with it as well. We can hide that from TGO, but we couldn't hide another gale emitting like gale is from TGO. We can only have 43% more emission from somewhere else. 
And that seems weird. Gale is an unusual place. It's weird in many, many ways. But is it so weird that there's nowhere else like it on Mars? I tend to think not. And Dorothy Oler and Giuseppe Etiope agree that Gale is weird, but not that weird. So it seems more plausible that there's something else going on in the sink area, that there is a fast destruction or a sequestration mechanism. And that's what a lot of us have been looking into. Those MSL plumes, they can be small and local, but anything that you see from orbit is big, and it shouldn't go away. So we need to figure out how it does. So um, there are a couple of possibilities. Most of these are gas solid reactions, and it might not be a, a huge surprise to you that I spent the first four months of my sabbatical working with the gas solid uh, reactions group at the Australia National University, and we have some ideas. Uh, Sushil Atreya at University of Michigan, he thinks enhanced oxidation near the surface is what's going on. And there's good reasons to think that that could be happening. The folks in Denmark, Jensen's group, he feels that there's sequestration of methane onto dust particles. And they find that the dust particles can attach methane molecules very robustly. My problem with that is what happens when you run out of dust. And then there's triboelectric glow discharge. This is something that's been bandied around for a while. We're playing with it a little bit in my lab to try to understand if that can cause some interesting and weird uh, chemistry. Sure, sure. <laughs> so it looks like this. So on, on Mars, you have such low atmospheric pressure, or sorry, yes, yeah, so, so low atmospheric uh, density, I should say that when you hit the, uh, the breakdown voltage, instead of getting a bolt of lightning like you get on the Earth or a spark, you actually get these sort of clouds of charged particles. So we call that a triboelectric glow discharge. And this is an example of it here. So this is um, two copper plates where uh, what's happened is you've exceeded the breakdown voltage in between. And instead of the spark, you get this wonderful glow. And you see this in low pressure lamps all the time as well. Uh, by the way, um, if you're curious how quickly you can dissipate a plume, this is a test I did back in 2016. Uh, you can see that even if we emit a nice little plume in gale, it gets smushed out over the course of a day pretty effectively. All right, so um, why might oxygenation make sense and what's the really weird thing going on? Um, methane, small component of the Martian atmosphere, you know, parts per billion, parts per trillion. Turns out, Oxygen is also behaving really strangely. This is from a paper led by Melissa Trainer. Oxygen is the fourth largest thing in the Martian atmosphere. How do you push around oxygen the same way you push around methane on a seasonal cycle? What's really weird is there's a correlation between the two of them. And methane and oxygen are about as far as apart as you can get on, in terms of redox potentials. So how do you push them around in the same way? If they're anti-correlated, Maybe that would make some kind of sense, but this is really weird. There's um, a clue here. I don't know what it is. So uh, get your proposals ready to answer this question. Where do we go from here? Well, the only way to figure out what's going on with methane is to make more measurements. We need more data uh, to rest our theory upon, because we've got multiple theories now that actually explain what's going on. To decide between them, we need to know which is right. MSL is not going to give us a lot more data. Uh, it's a very intensive measurement. It's not designed to do a diurnal cycle or anything like that. Um, and the absolute quantity of material, it's too small for orbiters. You can't expect TGO to look at one part per billion, 10 meters from the surface. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. sure. the, the ground-based measurements that started all this from Earth, that is. The telescopic they ones? They also look near the surface? Well, they, they look at column uh, the, methane. All the way to the surface. Basically. That's right. So, okay. Maybe you can ask an hour or later why, why that is not the obvious way to go. So it turns out the telescopic stuff, if you use JWST, so JWST is going to do the best job because this, these are um, infrared lines. Um, if you had an average of two parts per billion through the whole atmosphere, you could see it. And we are talking about maybe a part per billion confined to the bottom 10 meters. But do, do people 
people still believe these original measurements, or are you sort of also on the camp that that was probably not right? Not so, the, not <laughs> so, so, so for the uh, for the camera, I guess I should put myself on record here. <laughs> Now, there's, there's a lot to like, especially MoMA's group. They were very conscientious. And so I, I have some confidence in, in what they've been doing. You know, so that, that's the group that I tend to trust the most. Um, we'll have to see where this all goes because, you know, we need that coherent theory and we need more data to get us there. So future landed spacecraft, they could do this. It shouldn't be too much of a trouble. And the key to what we need out of this data, 0.1 part per billion level or better, you don't need to get much more accurate than that. You don't need like fractions of a part per trillion to do this. And so that's easily within the range of a modern cavity ring down spectrometer or an integrated cavity optical spectrometer or really any big multi-pass absorption cell. You've got to constrain the whole diurnal cycle. We need to measure methane the way that we measure temperature, the way that we measure wind speed to really understand this. And if you had that data set, then you could do some impressive things. You could measure the micro seepage overnight, like we've done. You could quantify the rise and the fall of plumes. The thing I hate the most about plumes is it's like, bam, there's a big measurement. Oh, that's a plume. But I want to see it come up. I want to see it come down. And that would let me test theories of production and destruction and sequestration. Um, just to give you an example here, so this is a little what if scenario I ran with my model. You can see overnight the amount of methane picks up. And then I turn on or off various fast destruction mechanisms during the day. So we've got sort of the 300 year cycle in black. But if you consume things in one soul here in blue, and if it's even faster, you can really tell the difference between these different models. So that's the sort of thing that we could start getting into. Here's another slide from Kevin Zonley's presentation at Ninth Mars. So there's a lot of confusion about methane right now, despite what's been going on here. And uh, this is how Kevin summed it up. And by the way, if you don't see the knife in my back here, the background of this slide is Schiaparelli's canals. Another scientific theory that has stood the test of time. <laughs> so he argues that transient variable methane is an extraordinary claim not supported by observations, doesn't solve any other outstanding problem, and creates several new problems. And I will forever remember the way that he ended this talk. He, uh, he said, you know, to let it go, to stop possessing it, to leave it to Frodo. <laughs> Gandalf will protect him. And, and I thought that was a good way for him to end it because I had just put in a proposal for a instrument called MAGE. <laughs> so what is MAGE? This is something I've been working on with uh, ABB out in Quebec. And um, it turns out that optical spectroscopy for gas analysis has come an awful long way since we launched the TLS and first conceived that. Uh, way back in the early 2000s. So here's a, an integrated cavity enhanced optical spectrometer. These things are robust. They put them on cars. They fly them on drones. It even spent several weeks on the top of a streetcar in Salt Lake City getting bounced around. And what's great about this thing is you get a phenomenal amount of path length from these very highly silvered mirrors. Um, we had point uh, sorry, we had 16.8 meters for TLS. ICOS gets 100 kilometers. There's no need to do the enrichment, and you can measure things very, very rapidly. When I talked to the engineers about this the first time, I told them, I'm getting two measurements a year. How do I constrain a diurnal cycle with two measurements a year? It's got to be faster. And they went away, and they came back, and they said, OK, John, you need to specify this. How many times a second do we need to measure methane? <laughs> So it looks like you know, once an hour is, is certain, something that's doable. You can take a few minutes, and you can get down to sub-PPV resolution with this. And uh, one of the notes I have at the bottom here, we could be ready in time for a Mars sample return launch. This is actually a fairly well-developed Canadian signature technology. All right, so let me just. Uh, it is. 
Oh my goodness. <laughs> this, this is one that we you know, contorted a little bit. Um, yeah, it was atmospheric gas evolution. And uh, I forget if M is Mars or methane or both or lots of M's in this, in, in this subject matter. Yeah, there, there are actually um, instruments for spacecraft where the, the acronym stays the same, but it, what it stands for completely changes. But everyone knows it by the acronym, so we keep that. All right, where are we going here? So TGO is going to continue observing. They'll have a whole year by mid-2020. So I'm still hopeful that they might see something happening. Um, and, and I'm sure TGO does as well. They wanted to make maps of methane. They didn't want to make maps of nothing. MSL, we're going to continue making our observations. We're going to keep getting those two points a year. Uh, and we're going to keep refining what's going on with that near surface seasonal cycle. There are no current plans to get more measurements. Mars 2020 doesn't have anything for this. ExoMars, so that's the Rosalind Franklin rover, doesn't have anything either for measuring atmospheric methane. Those telescopic measurements, they're not sensitive enough. Even JWST only gets you down to about two part per billion. However, we're going to keep building our models. We're going to keep testing theories for what's going on um, in the lab. And hopefully, we'll get some way towards uh, solving the mystery here. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for coming out today. Let me show the 13 papers my students published this year, just to plug them a little bit. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks. One of the geologists doing the boring bit, figuring out where the methane's coming from in the subsurface. Um, do I understand you correctly in that your diffusion and absorption models are dependent upon your measurements only? They're not, there's not a feed constraint that makes assumptions about what the subsurface source would be? So all I assume is 30 meters down, you've got some consistent source. And I can dial that up or dial it back um, to get the best fit that I can. Have you tested in the range of the assumptions that you've been made for the three major plausible production mechanism for methane in that subsurface, which would be one organic material that made some comment about the assumptions you could make about the preservation of impulse. Um, I know that there was no ability to constrain what any kind of ancient organic source, whether it existed at all or whether it was stored. But there is quite a bit of information that's coming out, particularly from the Earth analogs, on the kinds of flux you might expect for methane from, and I mentioned all mm -hmm. of them, which is a particular kind of localized mineralogy to produce methane. But there is a general source as well, which is radiolysis, because hmm. radiolysis, yep. of course, is uniform of all mineral type. Anything with uranium, thorium, and potassium is going to produce the hydrogen that would then feed a methane production. Hmm. Um, those three um, would probably give you significant amount of constraints that you could potentially buy back uh, calculation say something about what the origin of this might be, you know, just from a model perspective. Yeah, the radiolysis idea is, is an interesting one. I hadn't thought about that before. My goal in this was to be, you know, as agnostic as I could in the model, which is why we went with something below the, the seasonal temperature wave. So that, that was the, the main reason for, for doing it that way, to have that source that we could dial up and dial down. The problem though as well, is that the error bars are large enough and we are so impoverished in data in the sense that we've got 12 measurements over seven years that at least when we are looking at different sort of mineralogies and we were looking at, you know, does it matter that the, um, the thermal inertia of the soil changes as we rove over it? It turns out at the level of what I'm looking at, it doesn't matter a whole lot. We don't have enough sensitivity to that sort of thing. But in terms of getting a prediction of you know, what, kind, what the rates should be, yeah, that's some good suggestions, I think. Do you have any capability with major of any other technologies to measure H2? Because the methane to hydrogen ratio can be quite diagnostic to those three different sorts of sources as well. So I think that's something we'd like to, to, to look into. So right now, it's just the one laser wavelength. And so you're getting methane quite well. They do have models that they use commercially to get other gases as well. Oxygen seems like it'd be really interesting right now. H, H2 sounds like it'd be really interesting also. And especially isotopes of methane. I was, I was hoping. Oh, uh, yeah. I go for ethane and H2. 
Okay. And I'm a I miss my D to H work, I've got to say. Yeah, carbon 13 would be something really, really interesting, I think. Interesting. Yes, yes, let's do that. That, that's right. So, so the whole point of the exercise was to be agnostic about it because once you start putting the methane higher in the soil where it can interact with the, 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 the seasonal temperature wave mm -hmm. or very, very close to the surface, um, that way lies madness because you've got 12 points that you're fitting and you're adding additional tuning parameters. So I have no doubt I could get better fits, but I'm not convinced that the data is of sufficient quality to make them make sense. There, there are some people who say the seasonal cycle is just, you know, when the methanogens are the most active. And they're just, you know, you've got this green layer just, you know, two centimeters down. Um, yeah, so the, the, the reason I picked deep was just so that I could let the soil do its own thing and see if that on its own was enough to control the seasonal cycle. And it looks like it is. Well, let me add some quick first. I don't know if you trust those data. Is it could be that because of atmospheric condition is such that uh, you somehow locally concentrate rather than reduce the uh, Yeah, the big bursts are something different. I don't think anyone has a good understanding of what causes those to happen. There has been speculation that maybe some of it gets trapped and then the rover ro goes over something and breaks or, you know, a rock and then suddenly there's a big gush. Mm, I, I'm not sure how much I, I, I trust that. It definitely doesn't work for mother scale plumes. But there have been big outflows on Mars before of water, so why not an underground source of methane that suddenly gets kicked off by, you know, a nearby um, asteroid strike or something like that. And we have been, you know, interested in, you know, what's going on, you know, in a seismic sense in this area, for instance. There are large atmospheric pressure changes associated with going for diurnal and the seasonal cycle. Is that correct? That's right. About 10% diurnal, 30% seasonal. on CO2 sequestration, but they've done some very interesting modeling looking at the sorption of CO2 and the dissolution of CO2 in the subsurface. Mm -hmm. And they've been able to show that they can actually account for a consistent low level, but but what in the form, um, discharge of CO2 from subsurface systems just due to pressure changes. And I don't know if anybody's ever talked in the context of what that would mean, because all of the models that he's doing would be easily translatable in that thing as well. But that's true. Interesting additional Canadian Yeah, I, th I think so. Is that some kind of a, of a pressure pumping type of effect? Yes. Okay. I know that people. Well, that's neat. I, I know some people have looked at that for argon, but I don't think anybody has for, for methane yet or CO2. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> These are good ideas. Thank you again, John. And yeah, there's cookies upstairs if you want to pull that picture. There you go. <laughs>